That's going to change now because we're going to talk about the compiler. <laughs> I'm just kidding. This is the last talk of the day, so that means two things. First, I had enough time to spill coffee over myself. And secondly, I'm going to take it easy and not go too technical. What I'm going to do instead, if it lets me change slides, there we go. What I'm going to do instead after the introduction is to talk about some people that are involved with hex development. Because I feel this is a good opportunity because many people are here and many people deserve to be mentioned because they have been in this community for years and have contributed so much to various projects that they should just be mentioned. And after that I'm going to quickly introduce and talk about the road we took to hex 3.3 which was sort of a recipe, as it turned out, how the release that might have happened came to be. I'm going to briefly talk about various new features, and I'm also going to briefly talk about the new static analyzer. That part is going to be a bit technical, but it's quite short, and I think you'll manage. And in the end, we have a brief look out of the future, what's going to happen, and depending on how fast I talk, Josie is going to give a brief overview of some data-related information. So, first I'm going to talk about some people that are here. You have already seen most of them because many of them have given their talks. A few of them are going to give their talks tomorrow. So I'm just going to go through this list and mention what these people do for Hex or for Hex-related products or whatever. So you've just seen Hugh Sanderson, our C++ target generator and HXCPP maintainer. He also is always there when we need some technical input, when there are questions on how to represent an array, what he was just talking about. That's usually when he gets involved, and there are very many interesting discussions that arise from that. We also have Dan here or Nadako, as you might know him. He manages the Node.js externs, and he kind of took over the Python target generator. He's not the original author, that's Heinz Hölzer, who's not here this year. He was here last year. By the way, I take a shot every time I say that, because I'm going to say it a few times. And he's also sort of the savior of the Hex 3.3 release, which might have happened because he basically did my job last weekend when I couldn't do it and went all over all the issues and assigned them to various people and made sure all the important regressions are taken care of. We also have Kawe, who is our Java and C Sharp target generator maintainer and has been for several years now. I don't even know how many years it is, but it have, has been quite a few years. We also have Josephine here, who is basically the girl you talk to, <laughs> and also the mistress of the Hex blog, which I'm going to show you. Why does it? Okay. I'm trying to get out of the full screen, but it won't let me. There we go. So the hex blog. We try to produce content for it on a regular basis. There have been a lot of articles on Nicolas' series about hex. And there's some various other stuff, like Justin introduced Hello Lua which was a very successful article, by the way. And we try, to, we try to get content out. And if you have something that you feel like should be there, if you want to give a brief introduction to your framework or whatever, then feel free to contact us, because we are open to suggestions.
Moving on. We have Andy, you have already heard from Andy, what he does for us, he manages the jQuery externs. He's responsible for everything that involves testing, packaging, deployment, and whenever we need some sort of best practice advice of what tools to use, what, what web tools to use, and how to do something, it's usually a good idea to talk to Andy because he usually knows, and without him we would probably try to do our own things somehow and wouldn't really know how to do it, so it's very valuable to have him and his experience. And he also played a special role in what I labeled the hero, the Jason O'Neill succession crisis. For those who don't know, Jason, who was here last year, has since then founded his own startup. He used to be our webmaster, and he was suddenly very busy. And that was a bit of a problem, because there was nobody really who knew how to how our website works, so to speak. It was a bit embarrassing, but Andy and others banded together to resolve that, so we can now update our own website again, which I think is pretty good. We have Justin here. You've already heard from him earlier today. He's a Lua target generator maintainer. Yeah, and we have me. I'm the main maintainer of the compiler at the moment, and I do various other stuff that comes up. I handle a lot of documentation, issue management, team management, and yeah, um, various other things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm just kidding. I'm not that important. <laughs> okay, th those are the people that are here, or at least I thought so. I'll keep going for now. The people who stayed at home and sadly couldn't make it, of course, we have to mention Nicola Cangas, who is mostly being Nicola Cangas these days. <laughs> and he also manages the Hex Foundation. Unfortunately, he is not here this year because he's on a long time planned family trip to Japan. So I'm supposed to Dell update him. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm to tell you that this trip, unfortunately, has been planned for a while, so I couldn't make it this WWX. We have one very active person who has been very active recently and has done so much, which is Mark Knoll. He is, among other, other things, the mastermind behind code.hex.org. We introduced this, I think, about two months ago which it's a collection really of hack snippets with short explanations. We're trying to go for various levels. There are going to be entry level tutorial style kind of things, but also some really interesting macro related or related to whatever things. And you get short articles with examples and how to use them. We try to keep track of who the authors are, so we can bug them in case there is some bug. And it's really easy to contribute to this, this thing because we have the links here at the bottom. Add to snippet, which takes you right to GitHub, so you can just write a brief snippet. It's all in Markdown, so there's nothing hard about that. So if you feel like you have some brief, interesting piece of code that you want to share, then Please go ahead and do so. But as I said, that's not all that Mark does. Mark also, oh, by the way, this is how this whole thing started. I copy pasted the hex develop site and put some snippets on it. That's what he sent me one day, and he showed me code.hex.org, basically as it looked right now, and I was like, yeah, okay, we should totally get that online. And I think about two weeks later, we actually had it online, and that's how projects can come into life. If you just have an idea and want to do something, contact us, we'll see what we can do about it. Mark also made massive, and I mean massive, contributions to the Hex documentation. He looked at all these weird classes that I didn't want to look at somewhere deep in the Sys API package and added documentation for it. 
And lastly, he's also the guy that makes everything, everything looks nice. It's amazing because he says he's not a designer by any means. He does not do really much design in his day job, but whenever there are we have something and wanted to look nice. We ask Mark, and he just makes it look look nice. It's really amazing what he does. Then one person I want to mention is Andreas Mokros. He is kind of shaping up to be the next PHP target maintainer. I'm trying to push him in that direction because that position is a bit vacant right now. So if you come across him, try to encourage him to please maintain the PHP target because I don't know how to do that. And the original maintainer is not really maintaining it anymore, which unfortunately does happen. The community as a whole kind of compensates for it, but you still need one person who's responsible for that. And yeah, I hope that it's going to be him, if you're listening. More people, Gamma 11, I don't really know how this guy what his name actually is, so I just call him Gamma all the time. And he was very helpful during the Hex 3.3 release and did some really diligent testing of Hex development versions because he's working on Hex Flixel. And well, as part of that, he kind of caused a lot of Hex 3.3 delays <laughs> because, yes, we came across quite a few problems with Hexflixel related to use rewriting of the HXCPP target. And, but it's a good thing that we know this, these things before we make the re release, so it's much more stable now. Hexflixel is working, which is quite an achievement considering where we came from. Then I since learned that he's actually here, Valentin. <laughs> I thought, well, he was actually here last year too. I just didn't know who he was. <laughs> so glad to see he's here. He helped a lot with Hexorg and Hexlib as well. And there's also Kevin Leung, which is also part of the, well, Jason O'Neill's succession crisis because he is currently taking care of Ufront more or less. He kind of jumped into that position and I'm going to mention Jason O'Neill as well because even though it was a bit unfortunate that he kind of was just busy at some point, he really did a lot for Hexorg and most of the things you see on our website is stuff that he made including the blog. So yeah, he contributed a lot as well. All right, that's all I'm going to um, I have to say about people. So if you want to give these people a round of applause, of applause. Please do so. Now I'm going to introduce the Hex 3.3 recipe. First of all, we, we wrote a few things. I rewrote the whole static analyzer, which was announced for 3.2. I rewrote the whole new pattern matcher. I mean, what the pattern matcher is a new pattern matcher now. And as you has already explained, he basically rewrote the entire C++ target generator. And what you also do to make a release is you add some new targets. Justin has already introduced Lua. There's actually another target, which is called HL. Now, it's some mysterious new, but as I'm supposed to tell you, not quite completed target which Nicola made. It generates C code, not C++ code. There's not much known about it yet. <laughs> but according to Robert Conrad, it can run Tetris. <laughs> as we can maybe see here, yeah. So we don't know much yet. It generates C code and can be used to play Tetris, which is quite an achievement, I think. Then, of course, you also add a few new features. 
I'm going to talk about the new import HX feature, which is really cool and really useful and really simple. I'm also going to talk about struct in it, which is also quite interesting. And one thing we also did, we worked a lot on hex display modes. We have a few new display modes and we also vastly improved the old display modes. Hex is much better now when you request some information, like what is the type of the, of what my cursor is currently hovering over. Hex can usually figure something out and give you some information now which was, by the way, a lot of work because we had to internally add a lot of information so that the compiler even knows where the positions are. That was, I think, the biggest commit of this release, actually. We also made various other improvements and optimizations. That's what I just mentioned. The display modes are much more robust now. We also unified inline semantics and had 3.3, what could happen if you call an inline function with arguments that have side effects, for example, other calls. It wasn't really that well defined at which point in time these side effects took place or if they took place at all. And it was a bit of a problem to fix this because the usual approach is when you make a call to an inline function, you just bind all the arguments to temporary variables. But well, we don't want to end up with lots of temp variables in our output. So that was the original reason I started improving the static, ang static analyzer so we can introduce, introduce these temporary variables, but then remove them again if we don't need them. Of course, we also fixed a lot of bugs, and I mean a lot of bugs. I'm not going to list any because there are so many that I don't even know what to list. But if you've had a problem with hex.3, X 3.2, there's a really good chance that it has been fixed in 3.3. So you stare and bake that, and then you serve it on a nice website. And as you can see, hex 3.3.0 RC1 is now ready to download. It's, yeah. We did label it a release candidate because there are some issues that we know exist which we couldn't address yet, right, Kawe? And <laughs> <laughs> no, there's some other stuff too. And I'm sure people are going to come across some other stuff. So please download it, please test it, please file it. any issues you come across, even if it, seems, if it seems stupid, please open an issue anyway so we know about it because there's a good chance that we accidentally broke something. And we can only tell if somebody tells us. <coughs> so that's hex 3.3. Now I'm going to introduce the import HX scenario. Well, feature really. And the scenario in which we use it is, if we have a directory structure like so, we have our source directory, we have a pack subdirectory which has file hx and then we have this weird import hx file which is lowercase and we have the main hx file. Our import hx simply defines an import and then using in this case we import hex serializer run and we use string tools. And now what happens in 3.3 is that these import and using statements, you can basically pretend that they are on top of all the files which are in the subdirectory, in the directory itself, or all subdirectories, which in this case is main HX and file HX. So within these files, you can use hex serializer run, you can use a run function as is, and you can use all string tools methods as static extensions, which we can see here. This is the main HX content. And that's exactly what I said. You can just call run because we imported it like that. And you can use foo replace, which is defined on string tools. And this feature is really quite simple. It was also really simple to implement. And it's, but it's also really useful because you can just define your import HX at the top of your working, well, source directory and use it anywhere you like. It could be some assertion function or some logging framework, 
whatever you want. And what's important to understand is that it's file system based and not in any way package based. So if you have a pack package and an import hx in that pack package, it's not going to affect any other files which are in some other class path. It's completely directory based. And it also only allows imports and using, which is kind of logical because defining types in an import hx file doesn't really make any sense because they would show up in multiple modules, which is an error anyway, so we catch that early. And that's all there's to say about import hx. It's super easy to use and very useful. Another feature I want to talk about is structing it. It's a bit more complicated, but it's also quite useful. In order to understand what it does, I'll have to make two quick excursions, so to speak. I'm going to talk about top-down type inference. Now, don't be scared. It's not bad, I promise. What top-down means in this case is that we know the type of an expression before typing it, and that's very easy to see in a scenario like this. We know before typing foo, the string literal, that is going to be of type string because we read it from left from left to right, left to right, and we can tell that we expect a string before typing foo. This has some consequences already. For instance, you can do this, the compiler accepts it. If you did not add the explicit type hint to array dynamic, this would cause an error that arrays of mixed types are not allowed, which happens because hex never infers dynamic in any way. So in this case, we can use top-down inference in order to allow this. Another quick excursion, classes versus structures in hex. Classes have a rigid structure, which means fields cannot be removed or added at will at runtime. We can tell that a class has these fields and only these fields. Whereas with structures, they are more wobbly, so to speak. It's even possible to delete fields using reflect delete field, and that doesn't really make much sense if you apply it to classes, because you can't do these things with classes. Another thing is that classes, class instances, can actually be assigned to structures. So let's call it structural subtyping. As long as the structure is the same, you can do this, which means at runtime, we can't really tell if we make a field access on a structure. We can't tell what the representation actually is. We might have a class. We might have a real structure. It's not easy to tell. So to summarize, classes typically have better performance on static targets. You have seen that in use benchmarks just now. But structures are sometimes easier to initialize because you can just write the fields and their values, and it would be nice if you could do that for classes as well. So something like this would be nice. We have a user class, and we assign a structure to that user class. I always like doing these age things because it's fun to look at them in five years and think, wow, that has been some time ago. So right now this doesn't compile because the compiler would complain about name, string, age, int, should be user, right? It's a structure versus class in this case. So we can make this work in hex 3.3. All we have to do is extracting it to this class. It's the same code as before. All I've changed is I added struct in it. And now the compiler accepts that and actually creates an instance of user from this information. By the way, this is not related to vari variables directly. You could make a call like that to a function which expects a user variable. It would work the same way, a user argument, I mean. So. Implementation-wise, there are two components. First, of course, we have to generate some class constructor because at some point we want to actually in create an instance of the class. And then when we come across the structure, we want to call that constructor, in this case using top-down inference because we know 
when we come across the structure that we actually want a class so the compiler can make the necessary transformation. And if we look at the generated JavaScript of the example, it's exactly what you would expect. We have the constructor for user, and we have the call to user in the place where the structure was before. You can, I think, see the relation here. Now, an interesting question is, how does it handle evaluation order? If you look at something like that, we have a call function which changes some state. In this way, case, it increases the I field by one. So if we do it like that, I think everyone can see that A should be zero and B should be one, right? Because we call it post incremented. Now the problem is we can also do this the other way around. In this case, we want B to be two and A to be three, right? Yes, I think so. This works with structures, but if we translate this to a call, we somehow have to deal with this. And the compiler does that by creating temporary variables. You see both calls here. The first one we can just use as is. We can just use both calls directly because the order is all right. In the second case, we have to use a temporary variable to first get the value of B and then get the value of A. So you don't have to worry about that at all. The compiler takes care of it. It even supports optional fields. If we have on our structure an optional fields, it's entirely possible to just not define it in the structure below. As you can see, we have class myStruct and the field A is marked as optional. And down there, we can now initialize it just giving the value for B. In this case, the compiler is going to null now pad this. You might have to be careful on static targets because that might turn into a proper zero instead of null because after all, A is still defined to be an int. It's not a null int, so keep that in mind. But other than that, it works exactly as you would expect. Here's the generated JavaScript again. It padded the value for A by providing null and then uses the second argument. So much for new features, now I'm going to give a very brief introduction to static analysis. So what does static analysis mean? First of all, there's the static part, which means it's somehow information that doesn't change. Information we know at compile time. We can look at our source code and see this is always going to have that value, this variable, for example. But let analy analysis you all have a vague idea of what analysis means. We determine some information and utilize it somehow to optimize or to do whatever we want. Here's a very basic example. We have a main function. We have a variable x and assign one to it. And then there's a condition. And in the end, we trace x. Now, if you look at this code and just apply basic logic, you should see that x is always definitely one. There's only one place in which we assign to x, and that's the first expression of the block. So x is going to be one. There's nothing that could ever change that, which means this condition is never going to hold. We're never going to have x equals two being true which means we are never going to throw this exception. It's unreachable code in this case, which means we're simply always going to print one. And in fact, if you compile this, you're going to just get JavaScript console log one. All that other stuff, we don't need it. It doesn't do anything, okay? Now you might say, okay, I don't write code like that. It's a stupid code. Why would I write something like that? And they are, that's true. But compilation is pretty complicated, and there are various features which 
might cause something like that. Just consider inlining, which might make something like that happen. Macros for certain. Conditional compilation, interestingly, can also cause something like that because you could create a variable which on some target is always one and otherwise something complicated. So if you compile to the target where it's always one, you have some optimization opportunities and there's more which can cause code like that. And in the end, there's simply less to worry about. You don't have to worry about every single place that it's being perfectly optimized because that's the job of a compiler, of an optimizing compiler anyway to take care of these things so you don't have to worry about it. And compilers typically see some things that humans don't. It's often because it just gets really complicated when you inline a macro result, which inlines something else, it just gets complicated. But sometimes even uncomplicated stuff, it's just not really intuitive, but if you look at it and see what the compiler did, you would agree, yeah, we can really do that. So, here's a slightly more complicated example. We again have a variable x and assign a value to it, in this case one. And this time we have an if-else branch. And you can see that, well, let me first show this. This is a control flow graph, and compiler developers love these. I've spent a lot of time looking at these, and I think they are pretty intuitive. If you look at the control flow graph, CFG, and compare it to the code, I think you can tell what's going on. We have our starting block, which is the assignment to the variable, as well as a call to main get bool. And then we have a choice. We can either go right or we can go left, depending on the value of our main get bool. In this case, both branches actually do the same, and they both come together in the end to trace x. Now, if we look at the bottommost node here, we can see that all incoming edges cause x to be assigned to 2. So even though x is originally 1, at the bottom there it doesn't matter because no matter which way we took it there, x is going to be assigned the value 2. So we can conclude that, well, this must trace 2. We don't need x. We can, in fact, just use trace 2 which means we don't need the assignments either. We already know that x is going to be 2 there and it's not used anywhere else, so we might as well get rid of it. Which means we don't need the branching at all because once we remove the assignments, there's nothing in the branches which would somehow be interesting. And this also means that we don't need x at all because we already know it is 2. We don't need the assignments to it and the original assignment doesn't do anything. So what the compiler is going to generate from that is just the call to get bool. We cannot remove that because it's a call. It might do something weird. It might have some weird side effect. And then we do console log too. So all this just became this through static analysis. What I've just shown is a case of constant propagation. We determine the fix that is known at compile time value of variables and use them directly. There are other things that static analysis does, and I'm just going to briefly list it. There's copy propagation, which is kind of similar, but it replaces variables with other variables, which might really help with local DCE, local dead code elimination. You can detect all sorts of things that you just don't need in the code, as I've just shown. There's code motion, which detects if you have a loop and you do something within the loop, sometimes you could as well do it outside the loop. So instead of doing it on each loop iteration, you do it once, which might 
reduce complexity. And what we also do is a lot of simple code fusion and cleanup. It makes the generated code look nicer. You actually complains about that there are too, well, not enough variables anymore because we remove them all, which can be a problem on some targets because it makes debugging harder. And yeah, he's right about that. We'll have to do some, have to find some middle way there. But that's basically all that static analysis does at the moment. So have a, let's have a brief look in the future. And the problems Hex still has. We still have issues with Unicode support. We talk about it every year. Usually Nikolai is standing here talking about, yeah, the next version is going to have Unicode support, definitely. But it's really not that easy. And several people have tried to figure it out and how to approach it. But so far, we really didn't find a good solution. Of course, we want to make static analysis even better. There's so many things you can do with it still. There are so many interesting optimizations that you can do once you have the information. Oh, this, this API is kind of, uh, yeah. Nobody really knows how to the, the process API works and in which order you have to call which functions you have to make sure that your pipes don't run full and that kind of stuff on Windows anyway. And yeah, it's a bit annoying. And I know Andy wants to look into it and maybe find a way to have an asynchronous API as well, which would help with Node.js integration. So yeah, there's a lot to do in that area. Nalti is just straight up a nuisance because the problem is at the moment Nalti is defined as a type def 2T. So the compiler basically says it's the same thing and that's just a lie. It's not the same thing on static targets anyway. It's completely different. And we really have to look into changing that to reflect it in the type system because I know all static targets at the moment struggle with it one way or another. We want to further improve the display interface. As I've said, we've already done a lot and it's gotten much better, but there are still some more things we can do. And I know Nadako has many ideas of what we can do and how to approach it. And yeah, that's all I have to say about that. Thank you very much. Yeah, cool. Any question? <laughs> Several months ago, we had problems with our 2.3.1 compiler, and we tried to get a nicely built of 3.3. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, we had it broken on compilation with some kind of short message that analyzer can't do this and do you? Uh, okay. So, uh, <laughs> that's why, uh, two questions basically. Uh, the first one is, is it possible to uh, spin up some uh, you know, parameter, write something configured to have a uh, more precise call stack, uh, error dump or something to let you know what's wrong because uh, we just swap the compiler and mm -hmm. uh, we can't um, locate the problem. So that wasn't something that we changed a little and that's it. We just, uh, it just appeared from nowhere and uh, no way to detect it. And yeah. the second question is about to disable it? Yeah, it is. Um, I didn't mention that. It's actually enabled now by default in 3.3. It wasn't before, but you can just compile with, I think it's D no analyzer or something, so you can completely disable it. 3.3, we've tried about I don't know, 10 different variations of no okay. analyzer, no analyzer. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> <laughs> nothing works. Yeah, and it's kind of, I'm not really sure which build you tried. We, there was a lot of activity and I also fixed a lot of things regarding that. It's true, you, yeah, you're right. You can't really disable the entire thing anymore because it 
kind of does some things that actually fixes the code, but you can disable all the optimizations and that should still work with the no analyzer. I'm, I'm not quite sure which build you tried, so I guess you just, just get 3.3 and try again and then we'll see. Yeah, you can definitely do that, but you can just... Well, in that case, you really have to tell me which error you got so I can look into it because there's not really a general way to get more detailed errors. Well, it depends on the error, really. If it's some internal error, there are some ways you can get a proper stack trace that's possible. But if it's some typing error or something, then there's not really much you can do. In this case, just open an issue on GitHub and I look into it. Yeah, I understand it. If you just get a nightly build, you expect things to not working. But now that we released the release candidate, we kind of we're kind of saying, yeah, this should work. So if you try it now and get some error, please open an issue and I look into it because we test a lot of things and. A lot of frameworks are working. I know Car is working, Hexflixel is working, Polygonal DS is working, and all sorts of other frameworks are working. So it's not like we're releasing it in a totally broken state, but there can always be something that's not working, of course. So please just tell us about it so we can investigate. And one more question then. Uh, with, uh, on what platform do you build the uh, deployment pack for Windows? Is it still uh, uh, on the base? that's for you, actually. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes. <laughs> yes, it is all packed uh, uh, in Linux and built also. Sorry. You know this now. It hasn't been working all day, I think. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, shall we do it again? Okay. <laughs> then maybe there can be a problem with uh, compiling uh, for Windows platforms on Linux because we had to recompile our uh, Hux compiler yeah. uh, manually uh, because I was uh, just didn't work. <laughs> It okay. was broken, and uh, from some point uh, we had a um, mysterious uh, exception with C05 code that was originally uh, traced not in, uh, uh, from a camel yet. Okay. So it was not obvious, and uh, the problem seems to be in those libra libraries that are uh, linked to mm -hmm. the Okay, yeah, you really have to tell me which error you got exactly because I can't really tell you what okay, problem is. So just open an issue with the with what you got and we'll see. Uh, the struct in it uh, support abstract right now? No. And what about getters and setters? Sorry? Setters. Calling setters. the getters and uh, the setters. Oh, um, well, it's a normal class, so that should work. Okay. It's, yeah, it's a normal class. It's just how you initialize it. That's the only thing. Anyone? Yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you.